Welcome to Running For Real, a global community with a shared love and curiosity for running. Together we reconnect with the reasons why we love to run and discover ways it helps us become better people. Whether it's the quiet moments of a morning run while the rest of the world still sleeps, or befriending the strangers next to you at the start line of a race. We are here to connect with others who see running as the common thread that weaves our lives together. Come join me, Tina Muir, as I talk with people from all walks of life, united by a love of running. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 345 of the Running For All podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm excited that you are here and just want to take a moment as I don't feel like I say it enough for being here because I know there are so many podcasts you could be listening to. I know that we all feel overwhelmed by the amount of content out there, uh, the amount of conversations I hear of people saying, I can't keep up. And I know I feel that too. Um, so I just want to say thank you because I really appreciate you, especially when you reach out and I get to connect with you just for a moment. So you're not just a listener in a crowd, but actually a, a face and a voice and a person and a human. So I just wanted to begin by saying that today. Now, today I am very excited to introduce you to our guest. They are someone that I have been thinking about having on for a long time, but it just... I kept getting pushed off because I didn't want to do it out of uh, performative reasons. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to have the same conversations that they were having elsewhere. And also I was a little bit nervous because they just seemed to be on fire with performances. And sometimes when big things happen, uh, everyone (laughs) wants the same person at the same time. And I prefer to let things settle a little bit so that we can go deeper and have a more meaningful conversation. So today I am excited to welcome Nikki Hiltz to the podcast. Nikki is a national champion, a world finalist, the CEO of the Pride 5K, a six-time All-American. And Nikki, you have probably come across in the running world. They are doing incredible work, not only clearly as an athlete, but also as an activist, as an advocate, as someone who really continues to speak up. And today I wanted to have them on to have this conversation Uh, not only about the topics that they generally talk about, but also about keeping joy in running. Because I think that's something that we don't talk about often enough and and how easily it is lost. So we're going to begin by talking about more of the the general love for sport, keeping that in there regardless of what stage you're in. And then we're going to go a bit deeper into a conversation. I feel like as a podcast host, I have a ability to be able to speak to, or Nikki and I have an ability to be able to speak to conversations that maybe can't be had on other podcasts. Um, And so I wanted to go deeper. I wanted to have this conversation. And as you will hear, both of us afterwards were like, we were stumbling around because we were. And some of these conversations are clunky and that's just the reality of it. But I appreciate you for for listening in, for learning, for wanting to grow, for having an open mind. And I think you're going to like what you're going to hear in this episode today. So let's get to this episode with Nikki Hiltz. Thank you to Orlo for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Real podcast. I've been talking about Orlo for months now and I am loving the way it is fitting into my life. I can take it on a daily basis without any fishy burps because none of us like the, the omega-3s that are made from fish oils that have that gross feeling afterwards. I love that these are made from algae, which makes it very sustainable. It's the world's first carbon negative um, algae supplement and uh, it is just packed with omega-3s that are going to give you the benefit as you come into the racing season or just in general in life as you know I'm not really someone right now who's focusing on those things and I'm still feeling the difference now why runners why do we as runners need omega-3s well we need omega-3s to create ATP which gives us energy so we the more energy we have the more we can run the better we can feel it also helps with our mental clarity and our focus so we can pay attention we can stay in the mental game we can concentrate we can keep that inner critic out it's going to help you in both short distances and long distances so regardless of what you are running regardless of 
uh, what your goals are by having omega-3s, you are going to be making sure that your brain health is taken care of as well as your heart health. And while we as runners kind of think to ourselves, well, I don't need those things, that's what my running does for us, this is a huge thing to mention, especially for those of us who are women, as heart disease does target women and it's something that we need to think about. So as a friend of mine, you can get 12% off uh, Orlo Nutrition by going to O-R-L-O-N-U-T-R-I-T-I-O-N, Orlo, O-R-L-O, nutrition.com and use code TINA. That's going to give you an exclusive discount. You can use that code TINA at orlonutrition.com. You can also use the link in the show notes. Um, And I want to remind you that this is a sustainable supplement. This is not made from fish. This is uh, not something that is going to do harm to our planet. Orlo works really hard to make sure they are taking care of us as a planet. And I'm just so excited to be working with them. So head over to orlonutrition.com and use code TINA. One quick note before we begin, have you checked out for real episodes? If you are not subscribed to this podcast, go ahead and do it right now, or at least go back and check out our Wednesday episodes called For Real Episodes. Now, these are between myself and Sarah Crouch, a dear friend of mine who uh, I asked to join me on the podcast to talk about the most random of things. What are the strangest things in your refrigerator? If you had three wishes, what would they be? If you could go out to dinner with a celebrity, who would it be? very fun. They're very lighthearted. We ended up laughing through tears uh, in these episodes and they are short, like eight to 15 minutes, just a nice break in the week. And if you haven't already checked them out, go be sure to do that. You are going to love them. Nikki, welcome to the Running Through Podcast. I am excited that you are here and I've told you this, but I've been wanting to talk to you for a long time. So I am excited to talk to you and uh, yeah, looking forward to to getting to know you beyond what I've seen online because there's obviously so much more to you than that. So thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited. Yeah, I want to actually begin with something that is probably going to catch you off guard, but it was something I read about and it's something I feel quite passionately about, um, which is that when I was kind of doing some research on you, I read about for you, the importance of keeping pure joy and competitiveness on a very simple level. Um, in the article, they referred to you running on the beach barefoot and and what that meant to you in that moment. Um, but as an elite athlete and as someone who in many ways, you're running as your career, it's your the huge part of who you are, it um, puts food on the table, all those kind of things. I would love to hear why that remains something that's so important to you, because it feels like usually when people get to that point, that childlike joy just fades away because it becomes serious. So how do you keep that? Or why is that important to you? Yeah, I feel like um, it's like, it's what originally brought me to the sport and like it originally what it made me fall in love with it. It was just like, you know, being a kid, like, Oh, I'll race you from here to that trash can or whatever. And it's just so like innocent and pure. And then also so competitive. And like, um, that's like what I've always loved about running. And like, I think when I keep that at the center of what I do, it's like, that's when I can perform my best. And, um, yeah, I think it's just, it's also important, like for me to like, kind of remind myself like this is a really cool job like I get to run for a living and like um I don't know I think it kind of recenters me to like go back to just like my inner child <laughs> I know it's like a buzzword but it's like it's so it's so important um yeah to just kind of tap into your inner child and like I genuinely feel like we are the most ourselves when we're young and then the world or whatever else like messes us up along the way. And it's all about like trying to get back to that, like pure young childlike self. (laughs) Sure. Yeah. I, uh, so I have a two-year-old and a five-year-old, so I get to see this in many different ways, like the, the being yourself and, and even having my five-year-old ask me sometimes about what do you mean people like aren't themselves or not being who they are? Like she's so like, but why? And you're like, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, there's a few factors involved and unfortunately some of them are going to come to get you at some point, but we are going to do our <laughs> best to, to try and bat those away. Um, and then the other side of it with the running, like I see my kids just 
so excited to run circles around my house and uh, <laughs> yeah. to be pure joy, to be pure smiles just from that simple act of doing that. And but at the same time, it's so easy to say that as an adult. But how do you? I, I've got to imagine at times, even with that approach, it still is easy to slip back into, well, I have to do this or I need to do this, or I got to do this because of X, Y, Z. Like, how do you keep yeah. that in? Oh yeah. There, I mean, there's so much stress and pressure and like, um, definitely it's not, it's not always like sunshine and rainbows. I'm my little child running around. <laughs> Wait, I got to you there. You said sunshine and rainbows. Uh, that is what I say. I have Never, never <laughs> heard someone use the same two words as me. People always say like unicorns and rainbows or sunshine and and flowers. <laughs> like you said the same as me. I've never heard anyone say that. I just want to celebrate that moment. Sunshine yeah. and rainbows. Is that from Rocky no. Balboa? I think it is. I pro- I don't know. Probably I love that movie. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I'm no, just, no. I've never, I've had so many iterations of that, but you just said it the same way I said it. So that's yeah. Good. Anything else, anything else sounds wrong. Like sunshine <laughs> I agree. And un- unicorn that doesn't roll off the tongue. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Okay. So keep going. Um, as yeah, a yeah. um, I think like, yes, there is like stressor stresses and like pressure and all that stuff going, especially like when you're in a race, but like, um, I feel like this is something I've been working on recently. It's like, um, kind of looking at races as like opportunities. Like there's, um, like I get really excited and like, sometimes that excitement goes a little bit overboard and like turns into like so much nerves and it's like, okay, the nerves are good. The excitement is good, but like, leave the like outcome at home. Like you don't Mm. need that. Like it, you know, it's, it's, about the opportunity that what could happen and like, um, focusing on things that I love, like I love racing and like beating people or like, you know, seeing how well I can like kind of perform my perfect tactics in a race. Like that's what gets me excited. And like, you know, running too fast or like going out too hard with the rabbit, it's like things like that, like kind of scare me or make me nervous. So it's like, you don't have to pay attention to that. Like if you race everyone in the race and you like are trying to win at the end of the day, the time's going to come or like, Mm -hmm. um, so kind of like focusing on the things that like that get me excited and then leaving the stuff that stresses me out, like just leave it at home. Like, you know, it doesn't, it's, it's not about that. Yeah. Curious was something you said there about loving the, the competition. Do you think, you know, as kids, we all, well, I actually think my five-year-old's not very competitive, but in general, we all love to compete at things. Um, right. Even my non-competitive five-year-old still kind of likes to say I won or whatever. Do you <laughs> yeah. think we all do fundamentally love to compete in that same way in running? Or do you think it is a certain type of person as you get older that like thrives in that competition and some people just aren't that and it's never going to be that? I don't know. I don't want to say like, I don't want to say that it's a certain type of person. And if you don't have that, you'll never make it in the sport. Mm-hmm. Like I, cause I don't think that's true. I think, um, you know, my partner, for example, like we've, she's like, I don't think I'm like, um, I don't think I can hurt as much as you or like, and it's just like, I'm like, yes, you can't like, it's just like different strengths that people have. But like, for me, it's just, I'm competitive in like whatever I do. Like if we're playing a board game, like I'm like, I'm going to win or like, I want to win. And I'm like crushed if I don't like, so (laughs) that's just some, that's just a tool that I've always had for whatever reason, like whatever I'm doing, I want to be the best of it. And, Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think it's inherently necessary. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. How does that tie in for you with the work that you do and that you've always said for you, the track is a safe space and you do so much advocacy and activism and work in trying to make sure that people do feel that maybe the track, yes, but I would imagine most recreational people don't really have a desire to run at the track. So let's just say wherever, <laughs> like run on the roads, run in the trails, yeah. run on the wherever else. Um, although if you do want to run in the, on the track, good for you. Uh, th- that's uh, definitely a really cool, um, uh, place to be, but I know it's intimidating for like the average runner. Um, 
How does that tie into your work with, you know, you, especially you, you organized your virtual pride 5k, you, you know, have done events and those are focused on primarily inclusion, people feeling safe to even participate, let alone taking the competitive part out. So how do you bring those two things together, knowing that the competing is such a huge part for you, but there's such a big group of people who just want to be able to even do it, let alone the competitive. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like, I think those are so separate for me. Like when I'm you know, doing a community run or, um, speaking at a pride event or like anything with the pride 5k, like that is so much about like community and like Mm -hmm. just coming together and sharing this experience of running. And like, no part of that is really like competitive. Like the pride 5k is technically like a race, but the whole point is it is just to get as many people to show up and run Mm -hmm. a 5k to raise money for this incredible organization, you know, and help LGBTQ youth feel seen. So it's like, yeah, it's, it feels almost opposite of like, we're just going on a run to like form community and have these connections. And then my job is like, no, I want to be everyone. And I'm very competitive. <laughs> does that, does that feel like more sustainable for you that you do have it as two separate things that you're, uh, I guess, creating a place for, for anyone to be there, but you also have that side of you that, um, lives up to the the greatest potential to you in terms of how fast you can run. Yeah, I think it definitely helps me like be balanced as mm. an athlete in person and like um but even like like I'm so competitive and that's you know what's always driven me to perform well. But like as soon as I I'm only you know that Nikki for like four minutes. As soon as I cross the finish line, like I'm all about like being friends with my competitors and Mm. like forming community. Like it's so, it's such a specific time box things where I'm like focus, laser vision, competitive. And then, you know, as soon as that's done, I'm like, Oh, let's go hang out. Like, let's get beers. Like, good job. You guys like, you know, it's so, um, I, I, and I think that is a really good balance of not really, yeah, for, for the four minutes, be serious. But then after that, it's like, you know, this is fun. This is awesome. Like I'm, I'm all about like, the community of professional runners. And like, um, it's crazy. Like the, the people that I race against and like are competing against like prize money and all that. It's like, at the end of the day, like those are really good relationships and really like cherished friends because like, they're the only people in the world that understand, um, you know, like what I do every day. Cause they do it too. Mm. Do you think things have changed in recent years in terms of that, being able to have these deep friendships with people that you're yeah, competing against for big sums of money at the end of the day? Yeah, I think, um, I honestly didn't realize it, but like, um, I think like I read Lauren Fleshman's book and I was like, okay, it feels like there was more of like, just like less of a camaraderie than there is Mm -hmm. now. I'm sure there, there definitely was some, but like, I do really think that that's changed, but as long as I've been in the sport, it's always like, I mean, I also went to really good colleges that had really emphasized the team and like, we're going to be better as a team. And if we work together. And so I think my whole, you know, high school collegiate professional career has really been focused on like the people you train with, like, they're only going to bring you up and like, um, and same with the people you compete against. Like, I'm glad I compete against, you know, the best people in the U S cause it's like, they're making me better. And like, it's mm-hmm. this, um, I feel like for me, I'm really lucky. And like my generation or my whole career is really like people put a lot of like, I think it's a high priority or at least on my, in my list to like be a good sport and like lift others up. It's not this like zero sum gain. It's like, we all, when like one of us rises, we all do. Mm-hmm. The rising tide lifts all boats. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love that. Have you felt some, any elements of, because of your activism, your advocacy, the way you've been outspoken that some elite athletes have kind of almost shunned you because of, um, because they, they don't agree with, with your position or your thoughts on things? No, never from my competitors. Yeah, no, not at all. If anything, it's like the opposite, you know, um, like it, it's little things that like they'll do like Heather McLean, for example, you know, one of my biggest competitors, like she'll always, if I'm in the race, like she'll always make 
her caption, like, so excited to race this field of athletes, you know, like, I feel like mm-hmm. she like goes out of her way to not use like woman. And like, I noticed that, you know, and then even Ellie Perrier, like, uh, St. Pierre wrote a caption the other day and it was like, she's, she's pregnant right now, or she just gave birth, but it was mm-hmm. like, she used the term like pregnant people. Right. She didn't use like woman. And I was like, I have no idea if that's like because of me. Right. Like that's just, I think the changing world and like vocabulary is evolving. But like when my competitors like deliberately use inclusive terms, I'm like, that's so cool. And it makes me feel really safe. And no, I've never experienced the, all the ignorance and hate that I've gotten is from complete total strangers online. (laughs) Uh, Like never from, yeah, (laughs) never from like the people that matter in my life. Thank you to Trek Smith for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Real podcast and for supporting me and the work we are doing at Running For Real. Trek Smith is an independent running brand inspired by a deep love of the sport. Recently, as the weather has warmed and training is underway, I have enjoyed, as I always do, Tracksmith Session Speed Shorts from their spring collection. Now, while I have not got the new colors, because at the end of the day, environmentally, the best items to have are the one you already own, uh, they do have some beautiful new colors out in their spring collection, and they feature this exposed elastic waistband and a lightweight liner, so they feel as light as air and barely there. From uh, the first time I have worn them in 2019, they look exactly the same. They work exactly the same. These are durable and long lasting and beautiful shorts. For first time purchases, you can use code Tina New. That's Tina New, N E W, for $15 off your order of $75 or more. For returning customers, you can use code Tina Give. Tina Give, which is going to give you free shipping and a donation to support Track Girls. Track Girls is empowering girls physically, mentally, and socially through track and field empowerment workshops and grants. It is founded by Olympian Michelle Lewis Freeman and just doing some wonderful work there. So be sure to go check that out. I also just quickly want to remind you that um, Boston and London, there will be events at Tracksmith. I will be at both locations for their events so be sure to go check out the links in the show notes or at tracksmith.com to go see what events they are doing the boston marathon weekend at the london marathon they will have some fun shakeouts some other fun events be sure to go check that out and i would love to see you there if you're going to be there be sure to go to tracksmith.com forward slash tina to find out more about my favorite items so be sure to use those codes and go get yourself some of those session shorts So then I I mentioned to you before that we were going to maybe talk about this um, in terms of, you know, I've had, I've had quite a few conversations about this on the podcast um, in terms of just the, the competitive world um, of, you know, a lot of the discussions going on right now, there's obviously a lot of um, bans happening to ban uh, trans men, uh, women and girls from uh, participating in sports. That's obviously one one element, um, but particularly the conversation around trans women, um, especially in the elite and uh, collegiate world of, um, there's this, you know, argument that is, uh, this is not okay. They're going to, um, come in and they're going to win everything and it's not going to be fair. And, um, you have a unique position in that you are someone who is at that very top level. Um, but you also are very, very passionate about and, and outspoken about um, protecting trans kids, protecting um, trans athletes who just want to do this for their own health, for their own person, for um, who they are. And so I would love if you're comfortable to talk about that in a little bit more detail, because I think people tend to fall on one camp or the other. And there is... Um, there is a conversation to bring people um, into a place where they can maybe see that it is possible for someone like you to be an elite athlete, but also to recognize that um, it's not something threatening to let trans women come into the, into the professional world or the collegiate world. Um, so yeah. Is there anything you want to start with? Yeah. With that before we go in. Yeah. I think for me, um, you know, as someone who has competed in the women's category, like, my entire career. Um, I really hate that this argument is being framed as like protecting women's sports. Um, cause I have seen 
a lot of inequalities when it comes to like women's sports versus men's sports, you know, like unequal pay, um, sexual assault from coaches, like so unequal representation in the media, like so much like things that are actually issues in women's sports. Um, and I have never needed protection from trans woman, right? Like out of everything that I've faced, it's like, and I've seen my teammates face, it's like not a single one at any, we, like women's sports need protection, but not from trans women. And mm-hmm. I think that's been really frustrating of like framing it as these people are just trying to protect women's sports. And I'm like, you don't care about women's sports. You only care as soon as it's like a trans person because you're transphobic. You know? mm-hmm. And, um, mm-hmm. I think that's like really frustrating. And then, um, also the fact that so like these bills, you know, there's over like 300 just this year and it's, it's, the sport bills in particular, it's literally just like kids who want to, you know, play on the team that they identify. Like, it's not, it's not that deep. Like it's literally just kids wanting to enjoy all the aspects and things that come from being on a sports team. And like, I don't know, that's really sad that we're like targeting kids who just want to like play with their peers. Um, so I think those two things, it's like, Yes, of course, we can get into the argument of like biological sex and like, but it's like, that's not happening. Like trans women are not dominating women's sports. Like Mm -hmm. these are literally just kids who want to play like JV soccer. Like everyone, let's just calm down. And like, maybe we can focus on the real issues of women's sports or, um, you know, things like that. So I think that's kind of like what I go back to, um, when I see all these, you know, terrible things happening. It also points to a larger problem in that it's kind of the whole helicopter parenting thing of people wanting to control kids. Like they want to have the next Olympian. They, any, any child that shows any kind of ability in any sport, it's like, I want mine to be the best, which um, you and I both know the more pressure you put on children to get uh, right, go right back to the beginning of what we were talking about here, the more joy you can keep in their lives as children to compete the better off they're going to be. Whereas the more pressure you place on people to be like, you got to win and you got to like be the best. And, um, it's just focusing on the wrong area, um, in so many ways and us trying like parents trying to interfere and, um, and just, yeah, force people into certain positions or, or boxes or whatever. Um, because, they want to do the best for their child, but it's actually not um, helping the ch- the children in, in, in any way. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, so then but, uh, I just want to take this one step further for someone listening who may be like, okay, but then they're, they're not dominating sports right now, but what about down the road? What, what, what would you say there? I think I would say that this is, Oh, it's, it's so much more about just like sports is about, I think, inclusion. And like, I think sports has always led the way when it comes to like a a lot of social issues. Um, and I think if that happens, then like, we'll go from there or like, I think, but it's not even, we're not even letting that happen. Mm -hmm. And like, we're we're just gatekeeping it from even progressing. And I think, I don't know, at the end of the day, it's like, what, what is sports really about? It's like, what's uh, for me, it's like, let's like, you know, let's include everyone. Like I went to, you know, these really big track schools and we had, um, you know, I don't know, especially track and field. It's like, you have white people, you have black people, you have like, so, you know, you have throwers, you have like distance runners, like it's such like this realm of people and like this big melting pot of like, um, you know, and it's all rooted in like, yeah, we're all like just trying to like play our sport and also show up as ourselves. And so I feel like, I don't know. I think that's the most important lesson in sport or like what it's even all about. I think sport's a place for everyone and like, um, but we're not even letting it get there mm-hmm. in the first place. And that's, what's really frustrating. Um, I also think it's like, when is this cycle going to end? Like, um, you know, when it comes to gender, it's like, you know, we live in a patriarchal society and then it's like women had to fight for so long to like even play sports. Right. Mm-hmm. And then like 
okay, now women are in sports, like hell yeah. And then now it's like, it makes, I think it makes me sad when women are the one to especially like, you know, punch down at trans people. Mm-hmm. Cause I'm like, you're not breaking the cycle. Like it's just a no, now it's just a new gender minority that we're just going to like punch down on. Like, no, like we can break this cycle and like, mm-hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I Have feel you like had? Like rambling, um, but. No, 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 no. Thank you. I appreciate this. And by the way, if I say anything that, like, you know, you want to challenge or, like, no, I mean, I, I agree with everything you're saying. But if I'm like explaining something and it, uh, like, that's not coming across, then please let me know. But um, I don't. Have you heard Brene Brown talk about um, power over uh, versus power with? Do you know no. who Brene Brown is? Oh, I love Brene Brown. Okay, yeah. Good. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I also love Brene. Um, she has talked about how we're over is uh, an example of that would be the person who was in charge before the current person uh, here in the US. Uh, that's power over likes to, um, you know, yeah, exactly as it sounds, have power over people versus someone who likes to work with people to, you know, have everyone involved. And it, it kind of feels in many ways like right now there's this like group of people who who can feel the power slipping through their fingers and they mm-hmm. can feel that change is coming but they are so desperate to cling on to it that they're trying to yeah like this help to use this power over leadership which just doesn't work and it's like a last ditch attempt and Brene talks about how like it's never going to work you're never going to hold on to everything but it's kind of almost a sign that it's the last that they're desperate, that it's a last ditch attempt to hold on because, um, it's all they've got left is to try and hold power over people. Um, and, um, I'm curious if you, if you have seen that or think about that a lot about in terms of like, I mean, I'm sure you recognize it's a fear thing, but that you see the end, the light at the end of the tunnel here in terms of like the acceptance, um, across the kind of the majority of people. Yeah. I mean, I think that if you look at like history, like there's the most pushback when there is the most change. And Mm -hmm. like, I do really see like, like change come, like, you know, even just like elementary school now versus when I was at school, like it's so common for Mm -hmm. teachers to be like, what are your pronouns? And like, it's Mm -hmm. not, whereas like that wasn't even a thing like 10 years ago. And it's just like, they're, yeah, I think, um, I think a really big wave of change is coming and that's why there's so much pushback. And that's like really hard sometimes, you know, it's hard like being a trans person and seeing like all this pushback and hate Mm. happening. But it, I think it does. I'm like, okay, like that's because like, they're so scared because there's so many of us and like we are real. And like, Mm. it's, you know, all all these bills aren't going to make us less trans, you know? Um, Yeah. And it, I, I guess that's the point, right? Is that they're trying to just flat, like you're, you're pushing this boulder up the hill and they're trying to just like add to the weight, add to the weight to like hope they flat, flatten everyone mm-hmm. and be like, I give up. But like, this is that like peak moment, like the 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 darkest part of the night is just before the dawn. Is that the phrase? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of at the, we're, we're at that point and it's, um, you know, it's when you're the most exhausted, the most um, fed up, but uh, yeah, it's coming, it's happening. And like you said, it's not, it's not changing anything about people. It's not like, um, we can go back from this point, no matter how Mm -hmm. hard they try. Um, so I'm curious your thoughts on the IOC, um, has, uh, placed the responsibility on individual sporting federations to decide, you know, whether athletes have a disproportionate advantage or whatever. Do you Mm -hmm. think that is the best way of doing things? Or do you think that's kind of a bit of a cop out on their part? Um, I think, I think it's a little bit of a cop out. I think, um, (laughs) they, you know, for all the other, I actually don't know if this is true, but I feel like for a lot of other policies, they like have an overarching Mm. like rules and regulations, but like for this specific one, we're going to, I don't know. Um, I don't honestly don't know if I'm educated enough on that to speak on. <laughs> that, that is fair. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, that's absolutely fair. And so I've had, I had a conversation with our mutual friend who also connected me to you, uh, Jake Fedorowski. And la- when Jake was on the podcast, they talked about, we talked about what a future could look like within running. We were primarily talking, I think about marathon, uh, like road running and, and trail running, but what, 
what can a future look like where non-binary athletes, um, or I guess whatever we decide in terms of, of gender fluidity, gender um, identities can be included, but what do you see if we were to jump forward 10 years in the future? Uh, you can talk about track, you can talk about right, whatever piece of this you want to talk about, but um, I would love to hear your perspective on that. Cause that was a, Jake brought up some very interesting points, but uh, with my elite athlete background past, I found it really hard to wrap my head around some of these because it's just all that I had ever known was like a clock and a, and positions and finish. And, and so I'd love mm -hmm. to hear what, if you could jump forward 10 years or 20 years, whatever, what would you like to see? Yeah, I think, um, you know, for be, me being a non-binary athlete competing in track and field, I would love to just see the option to register for a race as non-binary. Like, mm -hmm. that's like, sounds so bare minimum and like <laughs> yeah. easily should be a thing, but like, yeah, we're thinking big here. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Like that would be cool. You know, uh -huh. I, I, there's only one race that I've ever done that I um, was like, it was even an option to register as non-binary. And it was the, um, fifth of New York roadrunners, fifth mm -hmm. Ave mile. Mm -hmm. And it's because New York roadrunners has done all the work with the New York city marathon, New York city mm -hmm. half, like all of their, it's a big organization and they've, there's a lot of non-binary people that, you know, live in New York or want to compete in the New York mm -hmm. city marathon. And so they're mm -hmm. like, Oh, we need to address this. Like, okay, we'll have a non-binary division. And then because of that, that was like for all the events that they put on. And the fifth half mile is like, it's a, you know, a big mile at the end of the year, a ton of people do it. It's, you know, mm -hmm. they block off fifth half mm -hmm. in New York. It's, it's a really cool experience. And like, um, I didn't even know, like my agent signs me up for races. So, um, you know, he entered me as like non-binary and I didn't, I was looking at the results after I finished second. Um, in the woman's race and I wasn't in the results. I was like, okay, did I get TQ'd? Like what happened? Like, and then someone was like, no, you're just not in the female resort results. I was like, what? And then I was like, it was this moment of like, that's so cool. Like I, I, and then I, it clicked gender and then I clicked non-binary and I had like, I was expecting to see maybe like, I don't know, three other people because there was all these community miles before the elites went off and I clicked it. There was like, at least like, 30 people. And I was like, Whoa, like that's like really cool. And like, um, I, I don't know. I was like, that's awesome. And like, I ended up winning that category, but like yeah. I got the second place prize money in the woman's race. Right. Cause that's the race that I raced and like, um, the next year. So that was in 2021. And then last year when I did it, same thing, but like, I knew where to look for results this time. And I was like, Oh, cool. I, same thing. I also got second this past year. And I like looked and I was like, there was even more, there was like, right. It went from like 30 to like 60 people. Mm. And I was like, it was just like really cool. I felt like I can feel alone a lot of the times in, um, you know, being the only or the first. Um, and it just like made me feel so much less alone and like, mm. so grateful for those people. Cause I was like, you guys are the ones that like made this category even happen. And like, um, I, I, yeah. I also got like second in that race to someone. And, um, it, it was like, I, you know, someone that was like assigned male at birth be me, but I was like, I don't care. Like, I don't care that like, Oh, like a biological male be me. I was like, no, like that's a non-binary person. I'm so happy for them. Like, it's not, it's not about for me, like winning or losing. It's like, it's like seeing the X next to my name instead of the F like that's what that category is about. And like, I just think that can easily happen in like every single track race that I do. We can easily like have a division where people can sign up, um, as non-binary. <laughs> so do you envision that as like three separate races kind of fit at every event essentially? No, I think for, okay. So it's different. I feel like when you're talking about like a big marathon, like the New yes. York city marathon, yeah, sure. like, yeah, no, I was talking about the, like, yeah. Things that have, yeah. Like track races or like new the fifth half mile and stuff. Yeah. I think it's just, I, I don't see it. I don't, I don't think I would ever want to like, it, it's just hard to, because non-binary, like to me, like the definition of that, it's so much bigger than just like a third gender mm -hmm. because like that it's just like, it's not like I fall, like I'm not boy or girl. I'm the third thing. It's like, mm -hmm. I'm like 
both sometimes yeah, yeah, or yeah. neither. And so it feels weird to just, it feels like we're just still, we know this like gendered world. So we're like third gender. And it's mm-hmm. like, I don't know. I think it's more fluid than that. And I think that you should be able to just register as non-binary and then compete. You know, if it's a big marathon, you all, there's no gendered starts. Well, like they send everyone mm-hmm. off at the same time. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's not like, um, but I think for me, just like the fact that I'm the only one, if it was a third category, I would just be like racing myself. And I'm like, that's, yeah. I don't want to do that. <laughs> Thank you to AG1 from Athletic Greens for sponsoring the Running For All podcast and for supporting me with the work that I'm doing. They recently were, uh, they funded the Red S recovery resource that I created, which I really appreciated. And they just care about the community. So I wanted to start by highlighting that. But what is AG1? Well, AG1 allows you to take control of your health, give your body what it truly needs. And now there's one serving of AG1 delivers this high impact blend of nine health products, multivitamin, minerals, probiotics, adaptogens, and more that is designed to support your gut health, support recovery, energy boost, and more. So everything we need as runners. As a friend of mine, you can get a one year free supply of vitamin D3 plus K2, another critical component we need need as runners, as well as from keeping us healthy from getting sicknesses. Plus, you're going to get five free travel packs with your order. So when you are traveling to races, you can have those with you. I do not miss days of Athletic Greens. And if I do, I notice it and I miss it and I crave it when I get home. So I have so easily slipped this into my routine. It is the one habit that I am actually able to keep. And I know that it's taking care of my gut health, my immunity, my energy, and my recovery. Those are all things we as runners need. It's got 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food source ingredients in one serving. And it tastes really good. It's almost got like a pineapple-y flavor to it. Um, My kids love it. And if a two-year-old and a five-year-old love it, that is saying something. So you can go to athleticgreens.com forward slash Tina. That's athleticgreens.com forward slash Tina to get that special offer as a friend of mine. Go check out AG1. You will see that the hype is for real. The reasons are are true and um, you're going to love it. I know I do. So then jumping to that 10 years from now like yeah we you've got your what we hope is small ambition of like every race offering uh, a non-binary division or category or um you know just uh gender assignment for a race but what so it, let's say in 10 years time you if if you're still competing at the same level um which we can hope you are uh <laughs> Do you, how do you envision that looking in terms of, so non-binary people can um, enter, so there's, there's still the two races and you kind of are in either of those or like, how do you, how do you navigate that? Like in your, if we were to jump forward and assume that the, that your first wish has been granted across the board. Yeah. Like how do we navigate it? Yeah. I honestly, I don't know. And like, I think that's, okay to say like I don't Mm -hmm. but I think right now like let's just include everyone and see what happens Mm -hmm. and like um I think it's also like it's really just important that we have these conversations and that we're open to change and we're open to like evolving and like um you know moving away from like gendered categories and um but yeah I honestly like I don't know but I just want to keep having these conversations and like it's not just on non-binary people or trans people to like have all the answers. I think we mm-hmm. all need to be having these conversations mm-hmm. and like, um, yeah. <laughs> and you, uh, along those lines, you recently talked, uh, I didn't write down the name of the podcast. Was it called the queer athlete podcast? Uh, yeah. Okay. So you talked about, um, how sometimes how representation is empowering and, 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 and helps people to feel, like they belong, like they are, um, welcomed and seen, but you also talked about how for you, it has been in some ways triggering because you, um, are maybe seeing people who are able to, um, move further along in their journey towards, um, their, um, in, in their trans journey, uh, in the, 
whatever that looks like for them. And it, for you, that's been difficult. So, um, maybe you could speak to that a little bit more. Um, I mean, I, mean I, I will put a link to the show notes for people to go listen to that episode, but, um, I think that is something that I hadn't seen you talk about other than, other than in there. Um, and so maybe we could, we could go into that a little bit more, um, with what you meant by that. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, obviously I'm a huge, you know, advocate for representation. And I think like, um, you know, seeing yourself in someone else is like huge when it comes to like believing in yourself and having the Mm -hmm. confidence to show up as yourself and all the good things that come from representation. But, um, basically sometimes I see trans people on their transition journey and like getting gender affirming care or starting hormone therapy and things like that. And it just, it kind of just, I feel like my sport is at odds with my identity sometimes Mm -hmm. because I would, I would love to do those things. Um, but I have to like, you know, I'm not as of right now, like I'm not going to take testosterone, start hormone therapy until I'm like, have closed this chapter of my, you know, elite running career. Um, but I do think that I want top surgery. I do think that's possible, but I also have to be like, okay, that's like probably five to 10 weeks of like no running. Right. It's a big, it's a major Mm -hmm. surgery and like kind of time off. So I have to be like, you know, time that, and people get injured all the time. Right. And they, they take huge chunks of time off, but it's like, I kind of have to be like, okay, is that worth it to lose X amount of months of training to be affirmed in my gender more? Um, you know, is that going to like maybe hurt me more than help me because I'm maybe going to experience even more hate or like pushback because of that. And so it's just this, like, I think it's hard seeing people seeing myself and, you know, these trans, these non-binary people, um, who are getting these surgeries or hormone therapy, to just be like, that's a part of my life that I really want. But I think I have to put that on hold, um, Mm -hmm. for right now, um, while I kind of chase this first dream. Um, Mm -hmm. but yeah, I also think it's, I've kind of reframed it and like, um, as like, okay, cool. I have this, my whole life I've wanted to be an Olympian and like run as fast as I can the 1500. And like, that's like, that's such a goal and dream that I have. And that's so cool that I can do that. And then, wow, when that's over, I can live this other really cool dream of like being myself. (laughs) And like, it's, Mm -hmm. I think it's sad that I can't, I feel like I can't have both. Um, but kind of like, okay, I get one and then the other. And like, Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I, I think it's just kind of like a journey I'm still on, but Mm -hmm. yeah, I would, yeah, I'm like, I think I'm like happy to talk about it or like the more I share about it, it's like the more people understand like kind of the conflict that trans people like face and like, um, yeah. Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and thank you for sharing that because, you know, obviously that is difficult. That's something that is very personal and weighs on you, uh, in, in many different ways, I would imagine, uh, did the win you recently had at the USATF championships in the 1500 as the first openly non-binary athlete to, um, to win, uh, did that kind of bring you another step along this journey in terms of, okay, that's, I'm assuming you have all these things you want to accomplish. You mentioned Olympian, uh, was that another thing that you kind of felt like you had accomplished and are you trying to work through like a list of things or is it, you feel like you'll just get to a point where you say, okay, I'm ready to, to move on or to move to my next step. Oh, like, like what's my list of like, do you still have, yeah, like yeah. a checklist <laughs> that you're trying to, I'm assuming that was one of them. Yeah, that's no, it's a good question. I think, um, yeah, that was my first national title on the track. I won a road mile, back in 2019, Mm -hmm. it was like the U S championship road mile, but, um, yeah, that was definitely a big, big goal of mine. Um, I would love to do that outdoors. Um, and then, uh, yeah, Olympian, I think, um, and I have some time goals too. I would love to break four in the 1500 and two in the 800. Um, Mm -hmm. yeah. So I feel like those are like kind of my goals, but like, I also, um, yeah. I don't know if like, I, it's hard to be like, yeah, if I check all yeah, those yeah, off yeah. then I'm like, <laughs> you know, cause I feel like you become an Olympian or like you get six at worlds or something like, you're just going to be like hungry for the next oh, thing. Yeah, um, yeah. 
Yeah. Well, I actually had the opposite and you probably don't know this about me because we have been just connected, but uh, I, so I had all these things I wanted to do. My biggest one was to run in a world championship and I did that. And I felt like at that point, that was my biggest box I wanted to check. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I actually reached a point where I had all these things I still wanted to do. The Commonwealth Games, it's because I'm British, so it was trying to run for GB mm -hmm. US. Um, the Commonwealth Games was the next year and my husband and I had kind of, who was also my coach, had kind of said, uh, okay, we're going to shoot for this and then we're going to, and then we're going to reassess. But I reached a point where I was like, and you wouldn't know this, but like, I suddenly was like, I'm done. And I just yeah. stopped <laughs> one day um, and didn't run a step for three months. And, uh, <laughs> and so for me, it was, that's why I ask that. Cause I'm always curious with people, whether they have like these things of like, once I've done this, then I'm ready for my next step. But for me, it was just like a random, I, I, I to give a bit of backstory, I got kicked off a track that was my home track and that just snapped something in me. Um, <laughs> no, you, that was it. <laughs> it. I mean, it literally was, I just was like, I'm done. I'm done. Yep. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I mean, there was more to it than that, obviously, but yeah. <laughs> uh, for you, there's going to be such a kind of uh, maybe a line in the sand or like a next step. And and while I'm in that next step of enjoying running for not being competitive and doing, giving mm -hmm. back and uh, things like that, it, it, it does make me wonder. Yeah. Like I always wonder with other people, whether they have these things, like for me, the running for Great Britain in a world championship was like the box I wanted to check, but it sounds like you've still got quite a lot of unfinished business that you're working your way through and you're still motivated and driven to to go after it. Um, yeah. I also think if I'm like, if there comes a day where I'm like, I'm done, like I'm done, you know, I know. <laughs> yeah, no, like you I can't fight through to, that for yeah. very long. I, I, <laughs> exactly. I tried. Um, <laughs> uh, so then let's talk about Lululemon with this. Uh, when they approached, I'm assuming they approached you, but maybe you approached them. I don't know. Were you skeptical at first in terms of their support for you and what? what that was going to mean, especially as they were maybe just entering the market, the running market, really making that clear the, the time that they were thinking or trying to get into the running space. Like, was there any part of you that was a little unsure with a brand like that coming in, what they were, what they were maybe after or what they were looking for with working with you? No, I mean, I think it was the opposite. I think I was really searching for a brand that wasn't um, I was looking for like a unique experience and, and, you know, a brand that wasn't so dead set on like performances and times and you have to be on the world team or Olympic team. Like mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm not going to run well if that's like, I have to do that, you know? Um, mm -hmm. and it was just like, yeah, the first zoom call with, um, you know, the head of run at Lululemon, it was like, I was like, Oh, okay. They get it. You know, this isn't about like setting American records or, you know, world records are like, it, it's about like, there's so much about community and like, um, you know, what I started with the pride 5k, like they wanted to be a part of that. And they're like, what you're doing on the track is great. You know, like you're a great athlete, but like what you're doing off the track is like, that's why we want you to be a part of our team. Um, you know, we, and it, it's also like, it wasn't like a, we want to come in and take it over. Like we want to like, you're doing great. How do we like help you? Like, continue to do great things or how do we help you make it bigger? Or like, you know, and I was like, finally, like it was such a relief mm -hmm. and like, um, this moment of like, this is about like so much more than just, cause I mean, at the end of the day, like, you know, making an Olympic team meddling, like all that stuff. It's like, that does nothing for anyone else, but you, right. Yes. Like, this is like, this is about the community and like bringing others up and like introducing running to people maybe who like, there's not a space for them yet. And like, mm -hmm. um, so that was like, yeah, it was just this really great conversation. I was like, that's the brand I want to be with. Like, um, and yeah, <laughs> I love it. I love hearing that. And you know, I'm sure you've had the same. I have uh, friends who are early athletes who are kind of horrified that we've moved away from performance being the goal. They just want to run. They just want to, uh, win things and, and perform. And, and that's what they think sponsorships should be about, but it, we've moved past that. And this is a place where 
okay, it may not be that you have to stand for something or you have to be an activist in some way, but you have to have something more to you, something that connects with people beyond, as you said, just yourself. This isn't, I, I've been, I've been saying this for many years that like shoes don't sell because someone looks at someone and says they're wearing that shoe. So if they wear that shoe, and I wear that shoe, then I'm going to be fast. Like you have to feel some kind of story, some kind of connection to that person to be able to want to go get that item. Um, Mm -hmm. And I love that now it has become more about that. So do you think it is important for uh, like, yeah, what are your perspectives on that? Like, do you think athletes should stand for something or be more to the community than just, yeah, running fast? I don't think that... I, that's like a hard, I, it's hard because like, I, I just have such the personality for it. And that's like, like, I love social media. I love like running with strangers and like community and like, but like, I don't, I guess I don't think that you should have to do that. Mm-hmm. I just mm-hmm. think it's really important for me to do that. And that's okay. what I want to do. And my favorite athletes are the ones that do do those stuff. And like, yeah. that's, you know, um, Ben Blankenship has become a really good friend, you know, and he started the, um, fast forest project. And it's like, you know, for every U S person that breaks four four thirty, like they plant a tree. And I'm like, Ben mm-hmm. has been, you know, a world finalist, like made X number of teams ran X number of times. And that's so sick, but I'm like what he's doing, like, that's, that's cool. And I look up to him for doing that. And like, I want to do that in my own way for the queer community or, you know, like, um, so I don't, <laughs> it's hard because I don't think it's like, you have to stand for something you have to be, but I'm like, that's important to me. And that's what I'm going to do with my platform or my time in this sport. Um, and I do think that should be celebrated and compensated for when it, if you are an athlete who is doing that stuff, like buy a brand, because that's, you know, that's important work and necessary work. And like, um, yeah. So you do say that like you do still see a place for athletes who, <laughs> Yeah, even if you're not speaking up for something that's maybe controversial or a hot topic or something that people, you know, want to pretend isn't happening, that um, there is still a space for people who just want to, yeah, run fast and and uh, and then go, you know, hide away for their training and come back out again <laughs> when they want to run fast. Yeah, I guess I, I guess I don't want to. I don't want to shame anyone for okay. That's doing a good that, point. Yeah, right? I should. I, yeah, yeah, like that's right. right. But like, are those my favorite athletes? No, but like, mm-hmm. I'm not going to shame them for that's you know their process and how they, um, you know, perform well or um, yeah. But like, I do really appreciate the athletes that mm-hmm. do stand. You do use their platform to call out, you know, inappropriate stuff and like do are passionate about things and start passion projects and kind of. Mm-hmm look outside of themselves. Like those are the people that I, I do really root for. And I, I try to emulate. Yes. Thank you for sharing that. And and that's a good reminder that I should be careful with my language <laughs> there as well. <laughs> I will finish here with actually the question I intended to start with, but somehow along the line, I, I, <laughs> I forgot to ask. Uh, and that is some kind of realization for you, an epiphany moment, uh, a changing a moment in your path that essentially led to this moment right here. Um, yeah, I think it's kind of what we were just talking about, but, um, I basically, I made the world championship team in 2019, um, in Doha and my goal was, you know, to make the world, make worlds and then make the final. Um, and you know, I made it through round one and I made it through the semifinal. Like I was the last one in the final. And it was like, you know, it was such a big goal all season. And then to like achieve it, um, you know, and I got 12th in the world, like, and then I was like, that was it. Like afterwards it was this, this like, and I think a lot of, a lot of athletes I've heard talk about, you know, the post Olympic depression Mm -hmm. or this, like you have such a big goal you're chasing and then you do it. And then it's just like, now what? (laughs) And it felt like I definitely had this like couple of months after Doha being like, now what? Like, that was it. Like, that's what everyone's working for. Like, that was just kind of like this moment and then it was done. And like, I feel like that moment is when I realized like, Oh, I need, like, if I want to keep going in this sport and keep staying motivated, like I need to do this 
this it can't just be about me and my goals. Like I need to like make this bigger than myself. And I need to like, um, you know, lean into my community and like bring up others. And, um, yeah, I feel like, and then the next year in 2020 is when I started the pride 5k. So I felt like it was like this realization of like, I'm not going to get anywhere if I'm, my goals are just like me. I want to do this. Like I'm, I need to be balanced in, um, yeah, bringing up my community and like introducing others to the sport and like, um, rallying around the queer community, but doing it through running. Um, yeah. So I feel like that was like a moment of like, Oh, I need to make this bigger than myself. And like, um, you know, that's, what's motivated me now. Like ever since it's like, um, yeah, I think just like all of the advocacy work that I've done. Was that something that came to you pretty quick or did you sit in that kind of, what am I doing here for a while? Um, I think it was, yeah, it was a while. It was probably like, cause then also COVID happened. Um, (laughs) it was pretty much from like October was when the world championships were were until March. Um, so a solid like five months of like, okay, I need to figure out something else that motivates me. Cause like, um, you know, and then, you know, the Olympics got canceled and it was, it was kind of this perfect storm of like, my running journey did get put on pause. And so I could really like, okay, what does this look like if I lean into this other part? And like, um, yeah, it was it, the pride 5k happened that June. So, um, yeah. So without COVID, do you think you would have got to that point or would you have just jumped back into training? I see. I got indoor season. I jumped back into training cause, mm-hmm. but I was like, I was really like, I I need to do something this summer. Like I need to, I think my plan was like, okay, all the prize money that I make in June, I'm going to donate to the Trevor project. Like I was going to try to find a way to partner with the charity. Um, Mm -hmm. but you know, do it maybe more. I don't think the, I I think that's a good question. Now that I think about it, I don't think that ride 5k would have, it would, I think it would eventually happen, but not that quickly. Like it was just such a, such a boom, like, well, I can't race. So now what? And it was kind of forced it to like evolve that quickly, I guess. Yeah. And I'd imagine, you know, while none of us would wish the pandemic, none of us would, there's obviously so much, um, heartbreak, devastation, just, um, really tough times, uh, that came out of that. There are, there are going to be, I'm sure many examples of what you just said there, that it, it allowed something, beautiful to come out of something that was really, really hard, um, across the Mm -hmm. world. And, um, and so thank you for sharing that. Is there anything else that we haven't talked about that you think is important to mention, or you would like to remind people listening? Oh man. (laughs) Let me get out of my list. (laughs) I think, um, I don't know when it comes to trans people, I think like so much of it is lost on like, like, I think the more like, I don't know even how to say this. Like when you meet someone that is trans, like if you're someone that's like very transphobic or like, like, I think once you meet a trans person, Mm -hmm. like, like the humanity seems to be lost, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And like, um, I think it's important to just like, if you're someone that, that doesn't, maybe is like transphobic or doesn't, you know, agree or is behind all these bills and laws. It's like, I don't know, like maybe just follow a trans person or become friends with the trans person and then see if you still feel that way. Because like, it's not like, we're not these bad people who are trying to like overtake, Mm. you know, your cis life. I don't know. I feel like I'm stumbling, but like, I think it is important. Maybe what I'm trying to say is like, if you don't have trans friends, like maybe question why you don't. And if you don't, um, you know, it, like maybe change up your, if you're on social media a lot, like change up your feed to like follow trans advocates or like trans people, just so you're like, I think it's just important to be more educated and like no trans people to like humanize this whole thing. Because mm-hmm. it's like, at the end of the day, it's hard to hate someone that, you know, and I think you brought up a really good point there about social media because I've, I've, this point has come up in a few different contexts, but in terms of like finding friends, um, 
I want to just highlight this for a second because I I know people listening have brought this up in other contexts when I when I brought it up. But okay, so like m- m- become friends with someone who is trans. Someone listening to this is saying, okay, for someone like Tina, that's fine because she can she can um, she has access to to people. She can connect with people in the podcast and then become friends from there. But the average person listening might be like, okay, but if I try and do that, I'm essentially maybe becoming performative because I'm just seeking out someone and I'm like, I'm selecting you. <laughs> right. I need to check this box. Um, but, and so I don't think that is maybe something that can be done for most people without it kind of coming across to that person you're trying to befriend as you're like tokenizing them essentially. Mm-hmm. Social yeah. media, as you mentioned, is, is such a good way to educate. And there's um, some, some accounts that um, are, I mean, there's obviously across the board, but there's some accounts that are very much just educational and, um, people who spend their whole day trying to, um, just begin conversations and start the, at the basics to, to give a working point for, for the average person to learn from. So I'm glad you mentioned that with social media. Cause I, I just want to bring that up as I've had that before yeah. where people have said that. And I, and but unless you're someone like I have a podcast, I can connect with people through that. Right. But um, yeah, that you just, I don't want to just be like you, <laughs> I'm yeah, exactly. make you my friend so I can check this box off. Um, no, exactly. And, uh, and so thank it's you a good for point. that. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Any last words you would like to share just in terms of what running means to you um, and what you hope it can continue to be for others? Yeah. I mean, running is like my job, but it's also like my safe space. And like, um, you know, it's where I can like do the most self reflection or, um, like inner work is just like a solo run. And like, um, I think that, yeah, I think it, it allows me to feel very like at peace. And then also, very seen. And I think that that's really important. And, um, I, yeah, I guess like back to what you're saying, like, I don't think that that should be like, I think running and sports in general, but maybe running specific, like is a place for everyone. And like, I think I would love to see, um, yeah, more people bring that energy and, um, inclusion to the sport. Yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you sharing with us. Um, I know we're both stumbling around a little bit with our words, but I I appreciate you, um, uh, you know, us kind of working our way through this, continuing to have conversations. Um, and I hope this is an example to everyone listening that like, even someone like Nikki, who has, you know, this is a a point that you are talking about all, all day, every day, you're kind of the person that people go to, to talk about this. It's still, it's still going to be a bit choppy. We're still kind of navigating as a community, as a society, how to go about this. So I hope this encourages people that it's okay to be learning continuously. And, um, and yeah, so thank you for that. Yeah, no, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'm like, why am I stumbling over my words so much? (laughs) Exactly. Like you said, it's like, we're all still learning and like, um, we're going to mess up sometimes. And like, that's okay. Like it's, it's how you like bounce back and like, mm-hmm. you know, um, just as long as you're moving forward, doesn't matter mm-hmm. the speed. <laughs> it's that humanity that you mentioned earlier. That, that's what we all have in common. <laughs> we we're all humans and we all make mistakes. So thank Definitely. you. No, thank you. Yeah. This is lovely. The running for real podcast and everything we do here at running for real would not be possible if it wasn't for the running for real team. While I am the person who you hear from most often and the, maybe the face of the brand, the rest of our team are such critical pieces of what we do. And without them, I think I'd just be running around in circles with ideas. So I want to take a moment to thank our team. To Jeremy Nessel, who's been with me since the very beginning. Kat McKay, Sally Pontarelli, Kelsey Wang, Sandy Gutierrez, Louise Murphy, Andrew Basola, Alexandria Will, and Maria Vargas. Thank you to each and every one of you for all that you give to Running For Real and our community. I appreciate you and I'm so thankful for having you as a part of the team. 
Really appreciated that conversation with Nikki. I am so grateful for all the work that they do and the role model they continue to be, not only for us as runners to reach your potential while enjoying yourself, while keeping that childlike appreciation for the sport, but also for those who have forever felt like they did not belong. Nikki is one of the best um, role models out there for runners of every every area, every background. It really is just such a joy to have them in our world. And I am so appreciative that they are part of the running community. I'm not just part of the running community, leading the running community. I hope you enjoy that conversation. And again, yes, we at times were stumbling a little bit. This is a hard conversation. There isn't an easy uh, an easy solution to us all finding a place where we agree if we will ever truly agree. I don't know. But I just want to thank Nikki for joining us today. I want to thank you for listening with an open mind and for just rethinking the way that we view some things um, and how just because things have are the way they've always been with always being in quotes there because it's not the case, it doesn't mean it's right. So you can check out show, links in the show notes. Go find Nikki at runningforreal.com forward slash episode 345. You can also find links to our sponsors in there. You can go get that all low omega threes, especially if you have a big race coming up um, by using code Tina at allownutrition.com. You can also check out Tracksmith. If you are a new Tracksmith customer, you can get uh, $15 off with code Tina new. If you are current or Previous Tracksmith um, customer, you can get, uh, you can donate to Track Girls, really meaningful nonprofit, uh, with code Tina Give, and also to thank you to Athletic Greens. You can get uh, a one year free supply of vitamin D three and K two with your order plus five free travel packs by going to athleticgreens.com forward slash Tina. Those links are all in the show notes. Thank you for joining me today. I cannot wait to see you on Monday for a Together Run. And remember, we have those real episodes now available. Go check them out. I'll see you next week.